recording. Okay. And we're recording now. And so this is Jane Spenson coming to us from uh, L.A. And Jane is a, a, a prolific writer. She's a, uh, an executive producer, a consulting producer. She's also a producer of her own uh, a web series with uh, someone else. Uh, and I'm going to let you talk about all of this in a second. But currently one of her shows is uh, Once Upon a Time on ABC. Uh, but she's written for uh, Buffy and Angel and Firefly, a lot of Josh Whedon um, things. She's written for uh, a, a lot of sci-fi, Game of Thrones, uh, Gilmore Girls. And, and I mean, is there anything you haven't written for? <laughs> Might be a shorter list, but yeah, uh, uh, you left out Pure Calling and Torchwood and, 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 and Dollhouse. Dollhouse, yeah. yeah. I, I wrote it up for the students in an email and and, and okay. listed it, and okay. and certainly people who are watching or listening can can tune in uh, or go to IMDb and, and look it up. But but also Husbands is a uh, was a is the web series you're doing with Cheeks. With yeah, Brad Bell, uh, aka Cheeks. Uh, yeah, that's an online show that we developed together. Uh, that's part of the CW online family. That's awesome. Well, the people behind me are part of the class. They're, they're, it goes around and, and different sides, and and, uh, and they will have questions for you. Um, I think, um, as well, one of the, the approaches that, that we can take when we discuss is um, if somebody wants to be a professional writer, what what should they do in terms of their own learning but also, what do they need to do business-wise in order to um, get a job writing, or whether it's spec or in television, as as, as you know, you do? Um, how how to appeal to producers and and to, you know and and the people who are going to make the, the decisions? So uh, that might be the overall umbrella. It's it, this is a film business class, so it's really about how they can connect up and how they can. Uh, make their dreams happen and and uh, and 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 break into the professional industry. Gotcha. All right, I'm, I'm ready to go. All right. So, um, is there someone here who 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 has uh, uh, the first question? By the way, all the people who are on camera, please raise your hands and let me know it's all okay to be videotaped and show up on YouTube. I think you need to read, if you if it's okay for you. I, I don't know. I can't tell. Him. So, all right, cool. Uh, so, who has the first question? Did you get a question I sent you? Huh? Yesterday? I, I did, but I'm not going to ask them. You oh, have okay. to ask them. So, what are your questions? Hmm? Right, yeah, I can ask a question. Well, if, since I'm not looking at you, you will have to talk because I don't have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> and as much as I would like that, Ryan, how are you? This is Ryan. He's got a question. Hi, uh, I am, I'm wondering because he said you you you've written on script on on spec before. What that experience is like and how difficult it is to get something purchased on spec. Gotcha. Well, generally specs are written as writing samples, not as actual submissions. Um, so right now the currency is to write a spec pilot. Than, and it used to be that you'd write a spec of an existing show, which is still done to some degree to get into a lot of the fellowship programs that are a good entry-level way in. You need a spec of an existing show. But even those are starting to trade more in spec pilots. So you write the first episode of a show that doesn't exist. Uh, the nice thing about that is that there is the chance that some manager um, or, or agent or or whatever, someone will read it, and some pro producing entity will read it and go, this is good enough that it should actually become a show. Um, let's put this into development. Um, so you can actually sell something that way. It's unlikely, but it happens. Um, another version of writing on spec is to create your own uh, intellectual property, create your own production, put it online, um, or write a comic book, or a novel or something, and get it out there so that somebody sees it and wants to um, develop it as a show. These are all, frankly, a little unlikely, but we're going for the brass ring here. Like, what else you got to do? You know, you, and, and if you write a good pilot or you do those other things, it also opens up all the doors to all the other things that can happen, namely getting staffed on a show, um, 
and getting produced to do, you know, whatever it is you want to do in Hollywood. Uh, so it's it's unlikely, but uh, but the the rewards are, are high enough that it's uh, it's totally worth doing. That's very cool. That's very cool. Uh, how much tape is there in doing something like that? That I mean, uh, what are the channels or what are the what do they have to go through in order to get their uh, pilot spec script to someone to read it? Well, you do it mostly. The, the best open door is still the fellowships and competitions. So the ABC Disney Writers Fellowship. NBC has a writers fellowship called Writers on the Verge. Uh, Warner Brothers has one too, I believe. Um, there are competitions, the Nichols Screenwriting Competition. Uh, if you just spend five minutes on Google, you'll be able to find places that will take your script. They don't take anywhere where you have to send money um, in with it. Uh, I suppose unless it's some sort of token submission fee. Um, but you can get scripts read that way. Uh, and if you've got a great script, you can also you know, get a list of accredited agents from the Writers Guild and do a little cold calling. Um, and you befriend people. You know, part part of the job uh, traditionally has involved having to move to LA. If you make that step, then you put yourself in a position where you can get assistant jobs. You can meet other aspiring writers. You can reach out to people that way and try to find yourself a contact in the business who read your stuff. Excellent. Other questions? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, please ask. I mean, I can't. Um, uh, how do you know if an idea is uh, can be turned into a, a decent movie or not? Well, I don't deal with movies. I just deal with TV shows. But a TV pilot is, is like a movie, but half as long. Uh, and you should know from your experience as a year, of years as a viewer, you know, the, write the show that's not currently in your lineup, but that you wish was there something that's um, not what everybody else is doing. Don't go, what's selling in Hollywood? I'll write a version of that. You know, if you see that um, people are liking Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, I'll write a similar show. Eh, Kim Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt's out there. What's your Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt? What's the Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt in your heart? Uh, find the stories nobody's telling. For a lot of people, that will mean drawing on your unique background. Um, right now, with the, he the success of Empire, uh, a lot of shows about with a diverse cast and a diverse story, those are being made right now. So don't be afraid to draw on on anything that's interesting or unique in your own background. Um, uh, and tell about if there's a world you know that nobody else is writing about, or a world you can find out about that nobody is writing about. Do that, and that'll that'll make sure you're telling a story that people will, will haven't seen before. Particularly a spec script, what you want it to do is, yeah, you, 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 want the, you want the email that says we're interested in developing this for NBC, but you're much more likely um, to, to hear back from an agent saying, like, you know, my assistant was reading this and all the assistants couldn't stop talking about it because they'd never seen, never read anything like it before. That's what you really want because that now you've got some now you've got people talking. You want to be the buzzed about pilot. Very cool. Who else? Yeah, Alex. Um, <clears throat> say I'm um, uh, like um, after you write the spec and it gets sold and you produce and you start writing for the show. Um, is that where uh, creating the series Bible comes into play? And when you create the series Bible. Um, uh, is is there like as there like is there is that pretty much like expanding what's in the spec already or does the series Bible come first before you write the spec? Very good question. Um, series Bibles are nothing I ever worried about, but it, it turns out um, I have friends right now who are writing spec pilots with the hope that they will get developed, and and so they are finding that a spec Bible is a useful thing to happen, a useful thing to have. What this is is after you're writing your spec pilot. You create a document that is about an eight or nine page document that lays out here are the basics of the show, um, and here are here's the kinds of stories we will tell. Like here's a sample season. Um, here are ten episode ideas that would be the, the ideally be the next ten. You do this before the project has sold. Um, 
mm. but when you're getting ready to go out and pitch it to people. Um, it's a very specific situation. I think there's a lot of emphasis put on story Bibles that make it seem like they are the thing that you use. They're actually not, I have never found them to be that useful. Generally what people do is they read the pilot and they use it to decide whether or not to staff you on a show. Mm. So this, uh, you know, an agent has your spec and they send it out to every show in town that's hiring people. And then somebody at, you know, um, Mm, you know, NCIS or Once Upon a Time or uh, uh, How I Met Your Mother or something picks up this script and reads it and says, "Okay, this person, uh, I like what this person's doing. I like how they how they write their dialogue. Bring them in for a meeting. Let's staff them." That person has doesn't care what other episodes you had in mind for that show. So ninety percent of the time, that person doesn't care about looking at your Bible. It's only in a very specific situation in which uh, a, an executive at a studio that's seriously considering buying this pilot is interested in hearing what the rest of the show would look like. So it's, it's unlikely to be a thing you'll need, but it's a great exercise because forcing you to think about what the series is going to be is going to bubble backwards and affect how you've written that pilot because you're going to realize, hey, this character that I put in the pilot serves no function in the rest of the story. Mm. Like, Maybe they don't need to be so profiled, so highly prominent in the pilot. You know, things like that that'll help you sharpen the pilot. That's more useful. That's very cool. Awesome. Who else? John? Yes. Hi, my name's Michael. I'm wondering what you think about the first five to ten pages of a script. Some people think it's very crucial. There are certain things that have to be established in that uh, margin. I disagree. I don't really think there's a necessarily a uh, good exposition model that needs to be followed every time. I'm just wondering what you think about that. Uh, I don't think there's a model that has to be followed every time, but they are absolutely crucial. I won't read more than five pages of a script if, 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 I, see, if I see a bunch of typos. I'm like, ugh, this person doesn't care about their product. If I, if I see that, that, that I'm not hooked into the main character, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not... They didn't set up why I care about this person. I have to know who they are and what they want. Uh, if I don't know that, I'm, I'm just not engaged. Uh, and, and I don't feel that I'm reading a writer who cares about engaging me. Um, there are lots of different ways to do this. Uh, you've probably noticed a lot of pilots fall into similar patterns. They do voiceover to quickly tell you who the character is and what they want. They do that stylistic thing where... Um, uh, we start in the middle of the action and then we jump, you know, one year earlier, or we, we start in the middle of some exciting action and then we jump one year later. These are all crutches. Best to avoid them. <clears throat> on the other hand, a whole lot of pilots sell because they have them. So I'm not saying lean on a crutch of, of, or, or use some kind of, you know, universal structure for pilots. Find your own way in. But by goodness, if I don't know who that person is and what they care about in the first five pages who the main character is, and what they're trying to do, and what the obstacle is, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to keep reading. And, you, and, and, uh, and like I started out, like, just be super vigilant about typos um, and making it look like a professional script, because people are trying, picking it up and going, like, is this person a serious contender right from, from the first page? And think about that first image. It's more than even the first five pages. If that first image grabs me, if I'm already elbowing the person next to me and saying, look, look at this, or if I'm already sort of gripped and like, oh, I'm part of a world, you know, that, that's very important. And, and that first image, there was a very cool video that I saw somebody tweeted a link to yesterday that was just this really cool supercut of the first image and the last image of a bunch of famous motion pictures. And, and how just seeing the first image and the last image, how they often mirrored each other, or they told, you could tell at a glance that it was the starting point and the ending point of someone's story. Like it's someone looking alone out a window, sad, and the last image is two people laughing together. And you're like, okay, this is clearly a love story. And they're just, and they told the story in those two images. That first image not only should grip me, but it should tell me what the starting point is of your story. Very cool. Um, any any other questions? I mean, keep going. Yeah. Um, so it would feel like for, uh, especially for sequels, or like the next uh, season of a show, 
Do you ever feel like you're in such like a time crunch that like the story like suffers as a result? Oh sure, yeah, and that's an advantage you guys have is that we have to um, break the story and write it and get it ready to shoot in about two weeks. Um, uh, so you guys have forever. And you can make your, your episodes better than ours. Uh, I've been lucky to be on some really good shows where we've turned out what I think are amazing episodes in that amount of time. Um, but you can totally get in a time crunch. You can totally, and you can see it on shows when you watch shows. You can watch when a show, uh, you know, takes a turn and then regrets it. Uh, it's, it's very hard to know with complete assurance where you're going. That's why I'm very jealous of shows like Game of Thrones that... Um, you know, get to, to go off a novel, they know where they're going, they know what already works. Um, that The first author's already been down the blind alleys and knows not to go there. Um, but you don't have to worry about that because, you know, you're, you're writing a spec. Um, and the wonderful thing is, on, on many shows, if, you, if the show, you realize that you've led yourself down a road you didn't intend to go down, sometimes you find glorious things there. Um, there is the beautiful accident of going, look what we did. We didn't realize we were setting this up, but we've, we've set up, you know, an emotional story we didn't expect to get to. Um, so, so it's, yes, writing for a series can, uh, can lead to crunch time where bad things happen, but it can also lead to a crunch time where wonderful things happen. Awesome. I, I have a question that I'd like to ask regarding, uh, you know, a lot of us here are going to be writing independently or might collaborate with another writer or even two for that matter. But but in probably rarer circumstances, I'd, li I'd like you to talk, one, about the collaboration process of writing with another person and then also the television process of, of, of the writer's room and the yeah. kind of politics and and cooperation, collaboration, you know, and pecking order and things that, that go into um, what happens if, you get, if you're lucky enough to be hired onto a TV show, and then and right. what can you expect? That's a big question. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, you should decide uh, soon if you are a solo writer or a team. Um, team, you'll always have somebody there at your side uh, to, to, to write your scripts with and to do... If you get hired, you are hired together. It means you split a salary. Um, it's the only job I know of where you where you actually are hired as if you are one person. Uh, and there are rules where they're not supposed to be able to give you different tasks. Like you can't, if you hire a team, they, they stay together as a team. You can't send one of them to set and keep one of them in the room, although it happens. Um, uh, as a solo writer, you just, you, you are one entity. Um, and, and do your writing alone, unless your showrunner decides they want you to write with someone else. So on Once Upon a Time, even though the, we had, no, no teams are currently employed on the show, if you notice, most episodes are co-written by two people. This is a particular technique that these showrunners, that certain showrunners have, where to get scripts written quickly and efficiently, um, they send people out with another writer to write as a team. Um, on Buffy, we did this a lot when there was a time crunch. We just didn't have time to write, to send one person out for a full week. We had a weekend. Okay, two people will each take half the script. Uh, and sometimes it'll even be bigger groups. Sometimes there are episodes that were six, you know, there are six acts in a one-hour TV show. Sometimes each of those acts has had its first draft written by a different writer. And then, you know, it gets smoothed out, made to look like one person. Um, but that's not at all uncommon. Uh, a, a group write. Um, if you write as a team, you have to decide how you're going to write as a team. Some people go, I'll take the first three acts and you take the second three acts. Some people say, I'll take the A story, you take the B story. Some people actually sit side by side, uh, like like songwriters at a, at a piano in an old movie, <clears throat> and they actually talk about each line of dialogue as they write it, um, which seems to me like absolute torture. Because um, you have to imagine just deciding with someone else what the line's going to be. If you are on a comedy staff as opposed to a drama staff, that's actually how you write every single script, uh, and it is kind of torturous. Uh, in you know, you're asking about the writers' room in, in an hour writers' room. What the room is doing, what you're doing as a staff, is you're sitting in a room together, 
breaking the story, which is what we call it when you are deciding what's going to happen in each scene of the episode. Um, you decide what your act breaks are. You've got six acts. You've got act breaks in between them. You decide what those are. You all work together to decide what every beat of the story is, um, what scenes there are, what characters are in them, and what happens in each scene. That's all decided as a group. In a comedy room, you do all that, but most of your time is spent actually writing the script as a room. Somebody sent out to write a first draft. Usually, almost every script, every joke in that script is going to be replaced through the process. Uh, so you actually sit in the room, looking at a project. Instead of looking at my face on the screen, you'd be looking at the script, and you're going to go through it line by line, and go, okay, who can beat this joke? Uh, is this scene working? Do we need the scene? What would be a funnier scene? Okay, what's the first line of that scene? Everybody shout out dialogue, and the best one goes in. And it, so if you love that kind of improv comedy, I can top that joke, I can think while other people are talking, if you, if you really thrive well in that situation, totally be a comedy writer, because not everybody can do it. Uh, that job also involves being in that room, often very late at night. Uh, drama rooms tend to have better hours. It's, it's the opposite for the actors. Uh, actors on a drama are there often all night long, they work extremely long hours. Um, while well, the writing staff is already at home sleeping. On a comedy, those, those writers come in and do a run through and some rehearsals and they're home at five in the afternoon and we're there all night. Um, it's, so it's, it's, you've got to decide which, which lifestyle fits what you want to do. Um, see, the dynamics in the room is you've probably seen different uh, credits in the opening of your favorite TV show and you've seen a lot of different titles. Those often are the titles of writers, and their job is exactly the same, but, the, but just because of the history of TV, at least some titles have gotten sort of calcified into place. So you're hired as a staff writer, then you're promoted to story editor, but you do the same thing, you're still just a writer, then executive story editor, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, co-executive producer, and then executive producer. And those are all just, you've seen all the titles, those are all just names for, for writers, and we all just sit in a room together and work on, work on the stories and go home and write scripts and, and do all do the same thing. So. So, that's awesome. I mean, well articulated. It's kind of a comedy room. is kind of like the, the wolf of uh, stand-up or something. I mean, it's kind of like, it's almost, it's almost like the high-pressure in, in trading, yeah. trading rooms that you see, you know, depicted in movies where you're shouting and yelling and touching. And yeah, it, it is. It can be. I mean, um, you know, there are certainly... The Frasier writer's room was always well known as being a very quiet writer's room, very contemplative, just like you'd expect, um, whereas other shows are, are more loud or quite chaotic. Um, but there definitely is a, a benefits for being fast uh, and for telling the joke that advances the story. Um, so, you know, you, you want a joke that's funny, but that joke has to do a very specific thing. That line of dialogue is there for a reason. It's there not just to be funny. There are very few lines that are just funny. Most of them also are reflecting a character, so they're making that character clearer. Um, and they're actually moving the story forward. They, uh, this line has to establish you know, that she has a brother and he's on his way, you know, or that the brother's always late, or whatever that line is there to do. Anything that you need a line of dialogue to do, you would demand in a drama that that line accomplish it um, accomplish it and nothing else, you know, and, and would accomplish one very specific thing. You can do exactly that with a joke. I think sometimes people think, like, well, it can just be funny, or this, you know, this suggests something about her personality that's not, that's, you know, like, I, this, this doesn't really reflect what this character would say, but it's a joke, so it's okay. And then it's not okay. The, the line has to do exactly what you want it to do and be funny. Uh, so it's a very, it's a joke, joke writing is a very specific, um, that is really awesome advice because if 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 I were to write a spec comedy or any one of us were to write a spec comedy tomorrow, uh, knowing that you know we need to be advancing the story and the characters in our jokes and not just trying to write something funny and 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 you know throwing spaghetti against the wall with humor. Um, I mean, that, that really helps us focus our minds as to what we need to accomplish in order to make the correct impression on the spec pilot comedy script. 
um, as as are all of the the advice that you've been giving so far. Uh, you were going to say something. I didn't want to. No, no, I'm good. Uh, my, but my my follow question to that then would be, how would anyone coming out of college, or, or not? I mean, a listener or viewer who's watching this. Uh, break into this process of getting hired as a staff writer. I mean, they uh, really somebody's. They've got to send a script in. They got to get it read by somebody, and and then I imagine get called in for an interview. And or, or what, can you describe that process of of like if you're hiring somebody, what what criteria they need to meet? Okay, there's, uh, there's like two different questions there. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a different way in for everybody, um, but in general, it's um, the, the, there's a list of things you can do. You can apply them all together or, or separately. Um, moving to L.A., getting a job in the business, getting some ex experience, um, uh, even if it's finding a local production and volunteering to PA, like get some, get some industry experience. Um, uh, Joining a writer's group, uh, there's one called Script Writers Network here in L.A. that's full of aspiring writers. Um, and if you, if you get together with other people who are doing the same thing, you can share your connections. Um, befriending writers, um, taking classes, UCLA extension classes, classes like you're taking now. Uh, if you're taking a, a class at UCLA, often uh, your professor, your teacher will be someone who's in the business. Now you've got a connection. Um, submitting to the contests and fellowships, that's the biggest one. Um, you can even, um, for managers, if you find a, a hungry enough manager that will read your material, okay, now you've got your first rep in the business. It's probably not someone you'll stay with the whole time. But, that oh, there are pitch competitions. Go in and uh, find a reputable pitch competition and go pitch your stuff and get feedback from them. Uh, Anything, you know, all these different things. Um, establish yourself, you can establish yourself as a writer in a different field. If you get a comic book published, now you've got a project you can come to Hollywood with and say, look, I, this thing already exists and is popular. Uh, making your own content and putting it online uh, is a huge way to do it. Even just a funny Twitter feed. If you establish yourself as a consistently hilarious Twitter feed with really good jokes, then you're going to start getting some... Uh, you know, get the catch the eye of you know Sarah Silverman or somebody retweet something that you wrote. Now suddenly you start getting followers. Now you you can you know there's you know tweets Modern Seinfeld and Kelly Oxford Twitter feed and um, the shit my dad said Twitter feed that turned into a show. There are Twitter feeds that are getting people hired as writers that are getting shows made just because they're so funny. Uh, do an online comic strip, whatever it is that you do, get your product out there. Don't worry about people stealing your ideas. That's an amateur concern. You have a million ideas. Every one of them is more brilliant than the one before. Uh, so nobody's going to care enough to steal your idea if they never saw your idea. Like, just get your stuff out there. Um, and then you had a question of, oh, if I were staffing a show, what do I look for? Um, I like to see that someone can write for voices they didn't create. The rest of the world doesn't seem to care about that because everyone's reading spec pilots and not specs for existing shows. So there's less uh, less chance to tell if someone can write for someone else's voice. So then you're left looking for can they write, uh, tell a compelling story, write great, you know, indelible characters. Um, for instance, imagine that you read the pilot of Empire as a spec script. Imagine that you were just looking for. Uh, I want to hire a writer to write something really good. If you read that pilot and you saw the way the character of Cookie is introduced and and hear her dialogue yeah, from reading it on the page, you would know right away, like, this person knows how to create a breakout character, a character that I haven't, that's done in a way I haven't seen before, that I instantly am both, like, alarmed but scared of. There's chaos in this person. But I feel for her and care for her so much, and I'm so interested in what she's going to go do. If you read that pilot, you would, and and the setup of it, it's so clean. It's King Lear. You know, you go, you know, this. The father calls the three sons together and says, "One of you will inherit my my fortune." You know, which which one will it be? I'm we're, I'm watching you guys right away. You know, there's a very clear goal. 
Um, you're interested in the outcome. Uh, you feel for the guy. Um, you feel for the, all of the sons. They're all set up as having their own things that they want and their own obstacles. Uh, a beautiful example of a pilot script. And, and you can get, find other pilot scripts online. You know, read the pilot for House. Read the pilot for shows that you love. Uh, and see how they did it. That should be a first ingredient. If you're gonna, if you're gonna build yourself, you know, a deer, you're gonna want to go look at some at some deer autopsies. Look at how the animals put together. Figure out how you make one. Um, so I would look for for a script that was as gripping, as compelling, with characters as as, as that pop off the page the way they do on Empire. Wow, that's cool. Other questions. Yes, Steve. Hello, my name is Stephen. Um, I just want, like in your words, to know what, when you were talking about, what is the difference between simple conflict and subtle conflict? Oh. In your writing. I, interesting. I don't, off the top of my head, have definitions for those. Um, conflict is conflict. I mean, you want, you want... I guess I can I can draw a different distinction for you between like exterior and interior conflict. I mean, suppose you're telling a, a love story. Uh, you can have a character who is their own obstacle, or a character that deals with outside obstacles. Uh, so you want to decide, you know, do you want this to be the couple that can't be together because her father forbids it, um, or do you want it to be the couple that can't be together because she's decided that she ruins everything she touches, uh, and therefore has shut herself off from love. Um, they're two different kinds of stories, um, uh, and, but they're both, they're both very valid. Uh, the internal conflict is probably a subtler one and probably a, a better one because it's more emotional. You've got to, the character has to change to make the story resolve, uh, and that's, that's, I think that's going to tend to be a better story. I hope that helps. He's nodding his head. Okay. Good. <laughs> Question? Um, yes? You talked about fellowships earlier, and uh -huh. I was just kind of wondering, um, like, I, like, what, how those play into the greater idea of you uh, kind of like, I, I guess, getting your foot in the door besides mm -hmm. just the extra practice. Obviously. All right. This, the, after the word besides. Oh, sorry. Uh, besides, like, kind of the concept of uh, obviously extra practice at what you do. Kind of thing. Gosh. Uh, yeah, the, the signal just got a little fritzy. But, uh, uh, yeah, the fellowships are awesome because uh, it's not so much what happens during the fellowship, although that's crucial. Um, which is that you write a series of, of more spec pilots, so you, you increase your portfolio. Uh, you also are making those connections. You are being introduced to agents and managers. Um, you're um, being introduced to writers. They invite guest speakers in every week. So you know, someone like me is going to come talk to you at the studio where you are having your fellowship every week. So you just you're gonna get all you're gonna get a whole handful of uh, of ropes that you can use to pull yourself into the business. Um, it, it's and a lot of the fellowships now are uh, the people who are most likely to get in are people who've had a false start, people who were working as a writer's assistant and then wrote one episode of the show on staff and then it got canceled. And now they can't get the next writer's assistant gig, or they can only get writer's assistant gigs. And they need that next jump up. Having been through the fellowship will make them so much more desirable as a hire. Uh, anyone who hires someone who's been through a fellowship knows that they've written a whole bunch of spec scripts under, um, under some supervision and instruction and have, have you know, spent a lot of their time thinking about the process and getting expert, expert instruction in it. They're just going to be more seasoned. So it's a really good way to get yourself in that, in that rung if you don't have another way in, or if you've had a way in, but it hasn't borne fruit. So it's an awesome resource. That's awesome. Um, if I came to you with a script, and uh, say for a pilot, and, and you liked it, but you couldn't do anything with it, 
What would be the likely follow-up question? I think we froze here. Yeah. You yeah. did that or she just got magnificent body control. <laughs> what happened? No. Oh, you're back. I think I'm back. You're back. We um, weren't sure what happened here, um, but it froze. I was The question that I was asking was... Um, you're still here. Okay. The question I was asking was simply this. I come to you with a screenplay, uh, or I mean a pilot script, spec script. Uh, you look at it. It's good. I mean, you know, you're, you're kind of impressed. But you can't use it. You're not going to produce it. it. Oops, sorry. Hi again. I can hear you. Okay. Um, what's likely the second question you're going to have for me, or what are you going to tell me if you can't use my script? That one. Well, I'm probably reading your script to staff you, not to try to use your script. So, because, um, you know, they don't really, TV shows don't really use freelancers anymore. Okay. Um, so if the TV show's reading your script, it's because they want to put you on staff, or they're, mm -hmm. they're looking to put someone on staff. Um, if I have, if I'm reading a spec script, and I'm going, this person could be a good fit on my, on my staff, the first press question I probably ask is, when can they come in and sit face to face with me? Because... The thing you do is you cast a writer's room like you're casting your show. You want people with different skills, and you want people whose personalities get along. Uh, and, and you want someone you can stand to be in a room with at 4 in the morning. So it's generally, at that point, sort of a personality test of, do I, do I like this person? Would I, um, would I want this person in my writer's room? Awesome. Awesome. And so, so the ability to, to get along, team play, communicate. All, all the all the things you would expect to be important are important. It's not just the talent of, of being able to write. No, and if you know if you know that um, if you've ever gotten feedback of like, gee, you you get angry awfully fast. You're not fun to be around. <laughs> uh, go, you know, work on yourself because uh, being able to be a a pleasant, cooperative, personal personable presence in the room. Um, is a huge part of the job. Uh, if if that's not what you like doing, if you don't want to sit. If you don't want your job to be that you're sitting in a room with people for, you know, ten hours a day, uh, doing everything. You eat lunch together. You know, it is it is a very intimate thing to be in a writer's room. If that makes just makes your skin crawl, then you may be a feature writer and not a TV writer. Awesome, and and one of the benefits of the. Um, Fellowships that that you mentioned is the fact that you you're writing many different things under some mentorship or some guidance. Mm -hmm. So you have a body of work that you can show, and th and that would that be uh, important too? I mean, because I can knock out one script that might go far, but if I've never written anything else, do I? Right. Oftentimes, if so someone will ask for a second script, even even when you're applying to a fellowship, there's often uh, sort of an an unofficial second round, where if you, uh, this happened to me when I submitted uh, uh, my spec to the Disney Fellowship, uh, they contacted me and they said, like, you're you're on the bubble. We don't know if we want you in the group or not. We need a second script to decide. Luckily, I had one, but it, there was nothing in the rules saying they were going to ask for one. So I, if I hadn't had a second one ready, I would have really been in trouble. Um, and I, also, different. You send your agent will send different scripts to different shows. So if you have, you you probably won't have a rollicking comedy spec and a terse drama spec. They you tend to be either a comedy writer or a drama writer. But suppose you're a drama writer and you've got like a really uh, a really dark Breaking Bad kind of show, and then you've got a a, a lighter one, one that belongs in the same portfolio, but that's much more whimsical. Um, you would your agent will send us to different shows, so um, you're going to want to have more than one, just as as many as you can, really, because each one gets better as your skills get better, and to demonstrate different different styles so that they can be sent to different places. Excellent. Um, one one further question, then I want to open it back up to the to the students, and that is, um, what? I'll, I'll ask this because a lot of people probably have this on their mind. Do I have to move to Hollywood now? I understand if I want to be in the writers' room, I'd have to. I've got to. I got to live right. where where I'm working. 
But as a writer, can I write for TV uh, living anywhere in the world, or can I write features living anywhere in the world? I mean, what, what, uh, and, and like you and I are Skyping right now, is it possible to, to do Skype or online things, or, or must I uh, pack my bags and ultimately head west or east, depending on where I'm coming from? Right now, the, um, the TV world is still in L.A., um, and uh, the Internet revolution has not yet changed things to the point where you can be anywhere. Um, you can make your online show from anywhere. Um, you might be able to write features from anywhere, but people are more comfortable in face-to-face -face meetings. Um, they're going to like knowing they can bring you in to talk to you in person uh, if they want to. Certainly, yeah, if they're going to hire you for a show, you're going to have to be in L.A. And, you know, the meetings for that show are going to be in L.A. Uh, the industry experience is easiest to get in L.A. It is still a, a pretty important part of the process that may change, you know, as more stuff is written online. You know, some, you know, a, a successful studio could spring up anywhere. Um, but right now, it's still in L.A. It's secondarily, to some extent, in New York. But even then, a lot of shows that shoot in New York, they still have their writer's room in L.A. Well, we have Empire is in Chicago, as is Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, and now the new Chicago, whatever, uh, uh, Shameless shoots in Chicago. I mean, there's, there's Sirens shoots in Chicago, and almost all of them are cast and written and staffed and, and, and done from Los Angeles. Yeah, exactly. I, yeah, I know the Empire's here in L.A. So, you know, all, those, all the writers that Empire looked at, they weren't looking in Chicago, they were looking in L.A. All right. Questions from the from you guys? I feel like I'm asking a lot of questions, but I'll ask another one if nobody else has one. Okay. Yeah, uh, did you start out as a writer and producer, or did you do something else and then move on to be a writer? Yeah, I started as a writer. I've always done that. I never even was an assistant because I got into the Disney Writers Fellowship. So I was able to skip the. Um, a lot of people start as writers PA, and they, you know, that's the person who brings you your lunch. Uh, and then become the writer's assistant, which is a great way to get training. It's a hard job to get, um, but that person is in all, in all the, in the room with you, taking notes for every interaction, and they get to, without having to think about what they would pitch, they get to see how an episode's put together week after week after week, every episode. I, missed, I skipped all that. I, w I got in the Disney Writers Fellowship and then got hired on staff. I was put on staff at Dinosaurs, which was a, a half hour um, with big dinosaur puppets. It was wonderful. And then I went on, I got staffed on a bunch of different sitcoms and then made my jump to drama, which was a big thing. That's like, I can, like if you suddenly realize I'm not an alpha, I'm a soprano, I have to redo all my training. It's like that. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I was always a writer. Wow. A lot of other people do come up other ways. You know, if you, um, if a TV editor or an executive, I know a couple of people who have been TV executives and have realized that they're in the wrong job, that they would rather be writers. Well, aren't they lucky? They're surrounded by exactly the people that can help them get a writer's job. Uh, so that is that is a way in. If you, if you have a way into some other job in the industry and then you can slide over into the writer's room from there. Or, you know, if you are, uh, I know... Um, Canadians are often asking me, you know, how should I, how can I move to Hollywood and get started? And I think the easiest way is probably to become, uh, to become a Canadian writer, get yourself established that way, and now you've got a body of work that you can take to Hollywood and say, look at all these produced episodes. Excellent. Um, a quick question, and that is, um, not going to be that quick in asking it, apparently, but... Uh, yeah. the, the, the question essentially is, um, actually, I'm going to let Ryan ask your question. Um, I'll come I was back. just wondering, like, uh, how close you you think, uh, this is kind of a weird question, but how close it, 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 your, your team, uh, what you write ends up being what you see? Like, how, how, how well it follows your vision of what the episode should be? Yeah, well, that totally depends on... Well, it depends on a number of factors. Um, on most shows, well, I'd say on all shows, the showrunner is going to take a pass at rewriting your script. Um, 
on some shows it will it'll be extremely right on a comedy in particular almost nothing will stay of what you wrote probably um on a drama maybe nothing stays maybe a lot stays depends on your showrunner um some some places you print a script and they and you and you never write a second draft um the showrunner takes your first draft does what they want to do with it on some other shows on torchwood for instance that showrunner just kept sending me back so i was writing draft 11 draft 12 of an episode. This was because he didn't want to rewrite me. He wanted me to find my own way there to the finished script. So that's one step. It's how between what you your writer's first draft and the shooting script, how much changes. Totally depends on your showrunner. Then between that and what whether the your vision for that is what or it ends up on screen, that has to do with the showrunner and the director. Um, in TV as a, a the opposite of features in TV, the writer is the boss of the director. Uh, that was my question. That's how that's how psychic you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you, you Sorry. are the boss of the director because uh, the director's just been hired for the week to come in, and they have to be the one who accommodates to fit the style of the show. And they're going to be directing some other series next week, so so they are they sort of tra they're traveling. You know, they they move from show to show. And they, you need to tell them. So there's a scene, an episode called a, a episode. There's a thing called a tone meeting, which is when you sit down with the director or get on the phone with the director, and either you, if you're producing your own episode, or the showrunner will talk with the director and explain scene by scene what they what they have in mind of of how they want this scene to feel, what the important thing is about this scene, um, what they can expect. From the different actors, you know, this actor likes a lot of direction. This actor, leave them alone; they'll find it themselves. You talk it through with the director, and that will help the episode look like your vision of it. Um, some people want to tightly control that. Other people are much more likely to say, you know, hey, you're the director; go out and put your put your spin on it. Um, and and so sometimes. The director will do something that isn't what you expected, but often it'll be better. I, I always find that I'm much happier I, once the, I know the director understands what I had in mind. Of uh, um, maybe they'll find something that's I'm not a director. You know, maybe the way I directed it on the page isn't the best way to to um, to make the point of this scene. So I, I I'm sort of believe in letting them letting them do their thing. Uh, it's probably better than tightly controlling it. And of course, a lot of this. You can dictate some of this by how you put it down on the page. Um, you can direct on the page if you want to. It's generally discouraged. It makes your script a harder read. And right now, you're probably writing scripts to be read more than you are to be produced. This is your, a writing sample. You're not really sending this off to Hollywood saying, put this into production tomorrow. You're saying, look what a great writer I am. Don't you want to bring me into your room? But obviously, you can, if you want, do medium shot on, and then angle on, and then in the background, out of focus, we see. You can do that if you want. But it is good to know that there is a difference between a, a reading script and a shooting script. Absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, even a shooting script will tend not to have a bunch of direction in it. Um, but a spec script really should be written as readable as possible. I try to make everything super clear. Um, like, if anything is incongruous, I'll indicate that in the stage direction. You know, if we go like, uh, if you're cutting from day to, to night in a different location, you know, if you've set up something, uh, she says like, I guess I'll find out later tonight. Then you do a, like a smash cut tonight, and it, but it's not. It's in a different location. Indicate that. Go like, now you may have thought we were going to see Janine's date, but in fact, we've gone to Paris. <laughs> Just make stuff really clear, because you're writing it to be read. You want people to not get confused. Um, and, and pay a lot of attention to the stage directions. That's your actual voice in the ear of the reader. Um, you can set a tone using those stage directions. Uh, and, and make sure everything flows. Scripts are by nature choppy. So I try to make them read, have a little more flow by the way I write the stage directions. Um, I'll tend to, you know, you know, Janine opens her eyes and she says, 
colon. Janine, line of dialogue. As we're reeling from that, we cut to new location. So it reads like sentences. Make it a good read. Excellent, excellent. It's, again, very good, very good to know. Um, again, I want more questions from you guys, but uh, as a producer and writing uh, and caring, you know, about the, the quality of the show and the, and the characters and the directors, uh, you know, a rotating director or an on hire director, uh, producers are also involved with casting. Mm -hmm. So what about when it comes to casting the show? Not just the name talent, but, I mean, sometimes they'll be involved in, in the weeklies or the daily players or something like that. Uh, for the actors out there, when an actor comes in, I because mean, you hear different advice from, from sometimes film directors than you do from uh, producer, writers, and television, how important is it to stick to the dialogue when you're auditioning or trying out for a part when the, that person who wrote it might be sitting in the room? Yeah, it's hugely important. <laughs> you don't want to be... If you come in and you've changed my dialogue when you're auditioning, you're saying, um, by the way, I'm not just uh, an actor, but I have opinions about your writing and I think I can write better than you. Um, and, and a lot of writers, being the insecure creatures we are, are, are going to... The first thing you're doing is telling us that you don't think we did a good job, uh, which isn't a good way to make an impression. So uh, I suggest sticking with the dialogue on the page. Um, and um, I, it's interesting. You know, like On some shows, you do more producing than on others. Uh, I've definitely been on shows where I've been in the casting sessions for my episodes, but I'm not the one making the showrunner makes the call. Um, on... Uh, Husbands, the show I co-created with Brad Bell, an online show, we did everything. So we were definitely, we were making the calls in the casting room. Uh, and there is, you know, it wasn't just about how well the person read the lines or conveyed the emotions. It was about the chemistry with the other actor. So often in casting sessions, you know, you're reading, you're usually reading opposite of the casting assistant. But every now and then there'll be a casting session where they bring you in to read opposite another actor. The chemistry. And so that's what we were looking for on Husbands, is we had the, character, the actor playing Brady read opposite Brad playing Cheeks. And we and so not only were we able to cast the best actor, but we were able to confirm for ourselves that the chemistry was there. Can, can we talk a little bit about uh, a web series? Because um, whether these uh, students decide to go into television or features, but they may very well create something for the web, and it may not just be a one-off. Maybe they'll create a web series or, or have already. Um, some of the uh, opportunities and challenges that go into that. Yeah, and quickly the distinction is disappearing. I mean, web series, I think, is it's, it's a TV show. Um, it's an online TV show, but it's, it's TV. There's the... It would be very easy for a person um, to not even know which of which of the shows that they watch are produced for traditional broadcast and which are produced online because most of us watch everything on the computer now anyway. Um, so if you go to Netflix or Hulu um, or you know or Amazon Instant View or something, you don't even necessarily know where that show started out. Um, you just know that it is available on your screen. Um, so. It, absolutely, it is a great open door where anyone can create stuff and, and put it up and have it seen. Um, and, and the fact that there are so many companies now that are making content that way just gives you more places to take your material, which is great. Um, the thing that is challenging about it is that you have to, as I'm saying, you have to do everything. You have to, you know, uh, if you're going to create it yourself, you're going to have to um, you know, find your line producer, and they're going to have to find a crew, and you're going to have to do all your own casting and decide, you know, what what level of caterer you want. Like it, it's all up to you, uh, because you are spending your own money. Perhaps uh, you want to make extra sure that the script that you've got is ready to go, that it is polished and professional. Um, just because it's. Um, don't think that because it's going up online, it's your chance to practice. Um, like it's got, it's got to be good. Uh, it's got to be quality, enough quality that it would get on TV, but it's just maybe something that TV is not doing yet. Um, if, if you want it to be something people cannot get more easily. 
Excellent. Excellent. Questions? Yes, Karen. Um, can you explain the Disney Fellowship a little bit, like how you got in and um, like what, it, what it's about and stuff? The Disney Fellowship? Is that what the question was? Yeah, so can you explain yeah. it a little bit? And sure. Yeah, if you just Google ABC Talent Diversity, something like that, you'll find, you'll find the page for it. Uh, and it's a fantastic program. It pays you. Um, you get a small stipend. Uh, you will come to LA, um, and you work. Uh, you you attend. Sort not quite classes, but they have guest speakers, and you get guidance from Disney executives on writing spec scripts, and um, you get to meet showrunners, right, working writers, every, all sorts of people in the business, executives. They're at Disney. They, if they really like your material, they may help you, actually help you get involved in finding an agent. They helped me send my material to agents, and I hired my first agent that way because I was in the program. Um, former fellows um, will come in and talk with you uh, and maybe give you some advice, maybe read something. Uh, so there's, it's a huge leg up in the business. And when it was started, it was very much seeking people of people with very diverse backgrounds and geographically diverse. It was part of a way to bring people in who wouldn't otherwise have the wherewithal to move to LA. Um, so they drew us from all over the country and Canada that first year, or first couple years. Um, but now it is much more about people who are already here in LA, who've already got, gotten started in the business. Uh, that makes it a little harder to get into if you're applying from out of state. Um, so, uh, yeah. You know, so make your make sure your application is extra polished. Make sure it's really clear that you are serious about being willing to move to LA and get started in this business. Uh, and um, and often I don't. I think they very rarely put someone in the program the first year they apply. Uh, your your previous year's application is kept very much active. So uh, if you are told that you got really close, and you'll be told if you got really close, that means your application is going to sort of get bumped to the top of the line the second year round. This is just, this is what I've observed. I don't have inside knowledge of this, but I've observed that people tend to be sort of a semi-finalist and the next year they get in. Um, so don't assume that anything that you can submit something that's kind of sloppy, and then the next year, the next year I'll submit something really polished. They're going to be aware of what your previous year's submission was. So make sure your script is really ready when it goes in. And if you get to and are popped out of the process, don't give up. That means that next year you might you you're much more likely to get get in. It doesn't mean that you. Well, I got as close as I'm going to get, so they're clearly not going to look at me next year. No, you got, you didn't get as close. You got really close, and that means next year you're more likely to get it. There and there are other fellowships besides Disney that you can look online and explore, and and that are are legitimate. Um, I've always said uh, that LA is a meritocracy, not conspiratorially. I mean, in other words, it's not like people are have figured this all out and said, okay, here's how we're going to make this happen. But it really does seem that that uh, advancing in one's career, whether it's a fellowship or otherwise, is based on what you present and whether you hang in long enough and what your next step is. In other words, so you get close, it's, it's almost like saying, well, let's see what this person does. And I don't know there's any intellectual thought that goes into it, but that, as you say, you know, then maybe the next time you get in because you got close. And it's kind of like, is this person serious? Are they committed? Do they have a body of work? Are they someone we want to include in our club? I mean, and again, I, I, I don't think anything of this is necessarily thought out. It just seems to have evolved in this manner. It, it, again, like looking at IMDb credits for actors. You know, they start out with uncredited extra roles, and they graduate to one and two line parts, and then a paragraph or a scene, and then somehow they get, you know, and, and they work their way up into the business, um, unless they're eight years old and they get a starring part in it. Right. You know. Yeah, totally. It's, it is very much, um, it is pretty much meritocracy. There is still, as we know, there, the, if you look at the numbers, you can see that the white men 
are yeah. you know fill the majority of writers' rooms. Um, but that's one thing that's great about the fellowships is that they are an attempt to balance that. They um, they help diverse writers and women get get that first job. Um, and then if you are good, if your material is good, and you are a nice person to have in the room, and you do your work, and you show up on time, and you do all those basic things, you will advance. Um, uh, it's a talented writer is going to get noticed. Uh, it's it's really the case. I, I I I have yet to hear of a case of someone who who fails to ever break in, um, despite having you know everything else that a that a working writer should have. Um, just just trust that uh, if you have the right material, uh, people will see it. Awesome. Awesome. Other questions? I can't see who's behind me, so somebody raising are you raising your hand? Yes. Yeah. I have another uh, question about how do you um like write in in today's like with there's a lot of films with a strong female lead? Do you write with mostly in that in mind to try to break through that um, the patriarchy kind of thing? Um, I think it's worth thinking about what kinds of movies are getting made um, if you're writing a feature. Um, and interestingly, I mean, I think that despite the fact that TV is full of shows with strong female leads, um, I still think it's one way to make a spec stand out is to write, you know, to write a character like Cookie, you know, um, uh, and and have that character pop and have it be a female character. I think that's that's that will catch people's eye. Um, one way to do it, interestingly, is to do a gender swap. Is to uh, to make an interesting character the way you know. Um, the characters in Alien were written so that they could be assigned to any gender, um, and so it was sort of a last-minute decision, I guess, to have Ripley be a woman, if, if I understand the history correctly, and it's created this wonderful character that you can't forget. Um, sometimes we trap ourselves just because of our own cultural expectations. We don't notice we're doing it. We, we consider ourselves totally enlightened people. And yet there are things that we do with female characters that just make them, you know, half a, half a tone less active than the male characters. And you can trick your own brain out of those habits by writing a male character and then switching it to be female or vice versa. Right. You can get really interesting effects that way. Um, so if you don't feel um, that your life experience has prepared you for writing this female character, write it as a male character and then see what happens when you switch it. Um, and and think about you know a active characters of different backgrounds that that aren't generally seen on TV and and don't I think the word strong is often misleading. You want to write a human woman that feels like a real person, even whether she's strong or not. Uh, a character can be interesting even if they are weak or you know motivated by their um, you know the character of Baltar on Battlestar Galactica was a weak man. But a great character, um, and you know, you could imagine a, a, a female character that is absolutely compelling, but doesn't always make the, isn't always morally strong. Um, and that can that can be interesting too. Um, the main thing is to write a character that you believe of as a, believe in as a whole and interesting human being. I, I think that's uh, absolutely stellar. Uh, but no, really, to write a human as opposed to trying to write, and the fact that people people have weaknesses and people have strengths, and not everybody's got to be a strong woman or a strong man. Uh, that that really uh, that hits deep for me. I think it's really cool. Uh, but I'm I don't consider myself a writer. I mean, I, I'm I'm becoming more of one. But I I did that once where I had written a, a situation. And I'm a divorced guy, and I was writing a, a, a scene between a, a husband and a wife that were divorced, and I kept thinking that the woman, I don't want her to just come off as a typical stereotype, you know, this is the evil woman, the, the yeah. shrew divorcee kind of thing. So part of what I did was I just, I, I did what you had said, was I, I wrote everything man and woman, then I just swapped who they were. Uh. And then I swapped them back, but what I, you know, <laughs> no, I don't mean I swapped them back. I, I swapped who they were so that the, the woman became a fuller, 
representation of the woman uh, of a human and not just this you know she had to be yeah. driven by love and human needs and everything else not just being the you know the 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 foil for this guy and the guy had to take on some of the you know the other characteristics so so when i ultimately swapped them back i think that the the woman character was much stronger and much more real and the guy was much more real than had i went through with the first exercise so for me it was a very meaningful and when i hear you say that it it truly struck a chord uh, yeah, and here, here's a trick you can do, which is after you've written your script, read it as if you were an actor getting ready to audition for one of the roles. So, you know, imagine that you are the actress that's going to be playing the wife role in your script and read it through and say, you know, what, if, if this, if I were looking at the script the way an actor does, where they're just thinking about this one character and they're trying to figure out why they're making each move they're making, uh, does this character make sense and are they interesting and are they being motivated in sensible ways? Because sometimes it's very easy to write a supporting character so that they are providing the lead character with their motivation in every scene, but they aren't themselves consistent. And it's, it's yeah. shockingly easy to do because you're always sort of, um, you, don't, you look at your script from that, from that one perspective, um, but if you look at it from, from different points of view inside the script, you can start to notice problems that you can then fix up. Uh, and, you, and, that's a, 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 and it makes you write a character that an actor is going to want to play. Uh, an yep. actor is going to realize that, hey, this character is just there to help the other character. Um, they're not themselves a whole human being, and they're not going to want to play that part. That's awesome. I mean, and, and it was cool. Is that this, that this uh, you know, appeals to writers and actors worldwide. So I, I really, really like that. Other questions? Yes. No uh, let me let me have Jennifer here. Yes. Um, well, I mean, for like an example of your divorce scenario, um, how you're saying that you switched them so you didn't have like a terrible woman as your like your lead or whatever. But then sometimes when you switch them, and then you have the woman playing like oh like let's say the man was abusive, and then she turns into this like weak role. But then you switch it, and then she kind of turns into like a bitch. There's like a little bit of a like. How do you go in between? So like, because a lot of times when you put women in power, they turn into like this awful person. So like, do you have any tricks to write a woman yeah. that is in power but not in like an eye of like, oh, this person sucks. Good question. Right. Yeah. It's that it is. It is a terrible thing that some of the qualities that make male characters strong, you put them on a right. woman, and they read as abrasive, um, and that's because society sucks, <laughs> 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 and yeah. our culture it has a built-in assumptions about um, about how women should act. And when you get a woman acting outside those roles, it it can read in a in a certain way just because. Of our stupid eyes and how we and how what our expectations are. Um, one thing you can do is um, use to use your stage directions to clarify. There was a script, um, it's a famous story where um, uh, they kept getting everyone who read the script would say, uh, "I I eventually liked this lead character." But God, she comes across as abrasive in the first 20 pages. Nobody's going to read past. No, everyone's going to tune out. Everybody's going to hate her. Um, can you make her have her emotional turn earlier? And the writer knew that was the wrong answer, that the whole point is for the character to go through this arc. And so what he ended up doing was he added a stage direction when the character was introduced to say, you know, this is Marjorie. Um, she's a ball buster. She's a tough lady. You're going to find her abrasive now. But by the end of the script, trust me, you're going to love her. Oh, wow. And that solved the problem because people were able to relax and go like, oh, it's okay that I'm not liking this character now because, because I'm going to love her later. The, the writer's in charge of this. I'm not having an experience that the writer didn't intend me not to have. Like, you, you, if, you, if you make clear to the reader what their experience is going to be, um, then they can relax and read knowing you're taking them on a journey. Um, that's sort of a, a, a sledgehammer solution to the problem. The better solution, uh, although it works, the better solution is probably to um, look, for, look for the moments when we can glimpse that person's internal landscape. So if you've written a character that is in danger, any character, for whatever reason, is danger of coming across as a stereotype or unlikable, um, 
then give us a moment where we see them, you know, um, uh, they, you know, the, stereo, the, the, the stupid version. The bad version is they've got a cat that they love. They've got, uh, um, they're looking at photographs in an album, and uh, they've got a tear on their face. They're looking. At, we see a moment where their hand shakes. We see a moment where we see a moment, find a moment, moment of vulnerability for that character, and you tend to forgive them everything. Look at what you know, the character of House got away with, um, because you knew how much how hard he was going to work for his patients. Um, and does the you know does his addiction make him more likable or less likable? Well, it sure makes him human and vulnerable. Um, so you know, find the instead of taking away from your character, and if you, if you want her to be aggressive, instead of taking away aggressive but likable, you don't have to take away from her aggression. Maybe you have to add something on top of it. You have to add the likability factor on top of it, and it really can be. Even though I said the bad version, it really might be as simple as give her. Um, Oh, there, here's a great example. Uh, I just read a book about the history of the Mary Tyler Moore show. Had a character in it, um, uh, Rhoda, who uh, was, everybody loves the character of Rhoda. We know it went on to become a classic character, but she was roundly disliked in the first, um, I don't remember if it was the first run through, the first table read, or the first time they shot the pilot. Everybody hated Rhoda. And some, one of the writers in the room said, Let's have Phyllis's kid love Rhoda. If the kid, if the audience sees that this kid likes Rhoda, they're gonna like Rhoda, and it worked. Suddenly, that Rhoda stopped testing poorly, and she started testing well. Wow, wow, good point. Yeah, um, just a housekeeping. We've got about 12, 13 minutes at the outside. Is that good for you? Sounds good to me. Awesome. All right, hey, Alex. Hi, my name is Alex again. I had the question earlier about the um, uh, this, uh, series Bible. Yeah. Um, I had a question uh, just to illustrate. I just like to illustrate the point you were talking about, like a strong female characters and make them like you know flawed but human. Mm -hmm. um, I I know like you mentioned that you like worked on um, uh, like on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And sure. one of the things that I know about like I've only seen a few episodes of Buffy, but I get the basis of it, and I've seen Battlestar Galactica. And um, one thing that I noticed, like, you know, they both had, like, strong female characters. Another one, Battlestar Galactica, like, like, Starbucks, she was, like, it was, like, a gender switch. And she okay. was, like, um, the badass, but she was still, she was still human. And, like, even though she's, like, a tomboy, she's still, she's still a woman. And then right. also with Buffy, I, like, I would imagine that, like, you, like, had, like, a lot of input from Joss Whedon, who was the showrunner, about how you want this character to be for, like, Buffy and stuff. And then I know Ronald Moore and Joss Whedon are two very different people, but like, um, did some of what you learned from uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer like carry over into like a uh, Battlestar Galactica? When like, did you like um, about how to shape Starbuck and stuff? Because I know it's like um, uh, so there was something Whedon esque, if I if I may say that, about yeah. Starbucks. So like, I it's just like I just I thought it was good compare and contrast. So it, was there something you carried from? Was there did you take what you learned from Buffy and carry it over with Battlestar Galactica for Starbuck? Uh, interestingly, no, um, because uh, by the time I joined Battlestar Galactica, I wrote a freelance in season three and then went on full time on staff in free season four. So mm -hmm. Starbuck was already there, fully fledged, for for more than two years before I got there. Mm -hmm. So that all came from Ron Moore. Um, I agree that Buck, Buffy and Starbuck have definitely have some of the same DNA in them, um, but I think that just came from two really enlightened guys, Joss and Ron, who wrote characters that felt like um, women they they um, admired, um, women they wanted to see exist on the screen. Um, they Buffy and Starbucks share some some of the same qualities, um, you know, that they are that they are tough and damaged um, and you know have have sort of love inside uh, and and the tra and tragedy that they've had to live with and stuff. But um, uh, but I think you find a lot of characters have that. Uh, uh, I I don't think Ron was you know some I've worked for some showrunners like um, my showrunner Gilmore Girls who was a real Buffy fanatic. She really loved that show. I'm not sure that Ron uh, was an obsessive Buffy fan. Um, I think that he found Starbuck in in his own heart. And if you look at a character like President Rosalind on that show, 
Um, there's another great female character, but that doesn't doesn't feel Buffy-ish. Um, so there are lo lots of different ways to make to make great women characters. Mm. Other question? Anyone who has an answer when you want to ask a question? Um, do you have any preference towards uh, storylines that go episode to episode versus storylines that go throughout whole seasons? Ah, uh, yes, the arc. Um, yeah, it used to be that every TV episode returned to status quo at the end. Uh, and then um, once we got DVDs um, and now streaming where people can binge watch, uh, you didn't have to worry as much about, we used to have to worry what if people missed last week. Now you don't have to worry what if they missed last week. Nobody's got any excuse for missing last week. So you can write shows that are um, that have you know, Game of Thrones style novelistic arcs. Um, I love it. I think it's great. I think it's great that characters have a history that you can tell a story that's compelling the way a novel is compelling. Books of short stories just aren't as compelling as, book, as a novel. You aren't as pulled from one chapter to the next um, as you are when you're reading a novel. Uh, so I like it. I, I do miss the opportunity to do the comedic standalone episode, which was kind of my specialty. Um, you know, the, um, the superstar episode of, of Buffy, and there were, there were a number of episodes I wrote that, that really only worked as standalones. Um, those are certainly harder to do, and you'd have to stop the arc to do your standalone. Although, obviously, you can still do, you know, the episode that focuses on the tertiary character. How are they seeing this overall arc? You can still do it. It's just a little harder. Um, so there, there's upsides and downsides, but I think the arc is here to stay. Well, I think that uh, Buffy did that well. I think X Files did it pretty pretty well too, where they had their standalone, but then they had the the three or four different storylines that followed the arcs that went through, and then the overall reaching arc. Um, so it, it's it's fascinating how television has evolved. I I would venture to say that I mean everybody's going to find writing or what they write you know, their own, uh, their own passion. Um, one of the things that I, I, I find fascinating is if you look at Buffy the movie and then you look at Buffy the series, Buffy the movie could go so far, but Buffy the series could really explore in depth the character of Buffy and her friends and the, and the challenges and the obstacles and everything else. So as a writer, I mean, if, 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 if I wanted to write and really fully develop things, I would think that the, the idea of being in television or web series or, or where, streaming wherever we're headed with, uh, I don't even know if we should call it episodic anymore, but, but you know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that gives the writers so much more freedom and liberty uh, to, to write and to develop their character you know, over time and to, to have an audience get to know them. Absolutely. I'm, I'm much more interested in, you know, the 13th hour of a character's on-screen life than the first and second, and movies only get to do the first and second. Uh, yeah, I think TV, write, TV writing is definitely the place to be. Well, that's very cool. Best, best job in the world. That's really very cool. Well, any, any final question? Um, you may, go ahead. Uh, I just had a, a question. Um, how do your royalties work? Do you get paid every time a film is screened, or do you get one lump sum for your scripts? You get both. You get um, you get your salary on a show. Um, your first year of working on a show, you just get that salary. Um, then once you're promoted from staff writer to story editor, you start getting paid for individual scripts on top. So most of your career, you get your salary, and then you get a fairly large amount, like $30,000 for each script that you write um, on top of your salary. So if you write three in a year, that's a whole bunch of extra money on top of your salary. Um, then every time that episode is rerun, you get another big lump sum. With, and each time it's rerun after that, you get less and less and less and less. Um, it used to be that a bulk of your, the money that you'd be earning once you had a number of episodes out there rerunning would be from residuals, and that's, that's the money you get when the episode rerun. They don't rerun shows anymore. Um, it's very rare to see a network rerun. Uh, they'll find a reality show or something to run during the summer, 
you know, why rerun something when it lives online and people can go rewatch it anytime they want to. So a whole bunch of uh, writer's incomes just evaporated when reruns run away. So now, yeah, you're, technically the residuals are still there to be earned if anybody reran the episode, but they tend not to. Well, excellent question. Uh, could I do a quick follow-up to that? Sure. Why, yeah. why don't online plays count as residuals? Like, like in the same, because I know something like Netflix gives like, I don't know, some insanely small amount to the developers, but it's still something, you know. Yeah, there is. There are um, there are small amounts built into the contract for if something's streaming, and there are windows during which you do and don't get additional fees. And, uh, but it is it is a very small amount. So it's it effectively is, um, nothing. It's, it's, you get a negligible amount for okay. when people watch it online. All right, cool. thank you. Guys. Uh -huh. And the question is why is because. Uh, yeah, why is because that's what we got out of the last negotiation, that last writer's strike. Okay. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, I, as somebody who produces online content, I'm aware how little one person's view means in terms of actual monetary value. Right. Right. <coughs> Any other last? Has this been useful? Yes. Yeah. Very useful. Very, very awesome. Very stellar. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Got lots of nodding heads that you can't see, and so uh, uh, very cool. Um, I, I want to give you the last moment or two to actually to say or sum up however you'd like to sum up. But this has been a, a really wonderful opportunity for all of us and for all the listeners and all the viewers who watch this in the future to, to really um, examine and get inside you know, the kind of work and lifestyle that a television writer has and, and what's needed in, in terms to advance themselves as a career. And so I can't thank you enough. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, best of luck to all of you. Write that good material. Get it out there. Don't worry about ideas getting stolen. Just get them out there. You've got a million of them. Be seen, be heard. Move to L.A. and um, change the world. And uh, <laughs> that's very cool. And uh, Once Upon a Time is airing. And... Uh, Nights. On Sunday nights, and uh, and husbands they can find online. That's right. Google just Google the word husbands, or have to go to husbandsseries.com. You can check out husbands. Jane Spencer, thank you so very very much. Thank um, you. I'm going to call you in a little while from the car just to debrief and say thanks, um, okay. and uh, and uh, I'll do that when I leave here. But uh, I really do uh, appreciate this, and have have a fabulous day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye for now.